All right, good morning or good afternoon. You'll see me attempt to flatten this large elm cookie on my bandsaw mill. This piece is 31 inches wide and about six inches thick. Uh, two days before, I had some really good success doing this same technique with a large blue spruce cookie. That wood is much softer than this elm. And so I had great success with that. And then when I went to go do this elm, the blade was tracking all over the place and I attributed it to maybe that the wood was much harder than the blue spruce. So you'll see me make multiple attempts here and the blades wandering up and down, which never got it flat. Um, so actually I found out later when this video was done being filmed that this blade was damaged and that's why it wasn't tracking well. So um, you'll see me make a couple more cuts here. It wasn't working and that'll lead us to the rest of the video. All right, so here's a quick overview of my router sled. It's basically angle iron that is three inch by two inch, and I'll explain why one side is longer here in a second. Um, it comes down to a main angle iron sled body, and I like this design a lot. Um, this provides a ton of rigidity. You can see that I welded these wheels on there so that it has really smooth action back and forth. There's a lot of things that I like about it. What I don't like about it in router sleds in general is that it creates a huge mess in my shop. All right, so we're gonna switch over to the actual bit that I use, it's from a Mana Tool. It's a four-sided carbide bit, which re reduces the tear out, and it's actually been a good bit, I'm happy with it. Um, the whole reason why I'm showing you the modification of the sled is because this cookie piece is too big. As you see here, the sled is running into it because it's six inches tall and it's easier to make adjustments on the sled than it is to make adjustments under the rails. So what I did is I squared up some lumber and I cut a little V groove in it and then these blocks will be placed under the sled on the rail. And I used some paste wax here to try to make it as slick as possible because the action of the sled is much slower without it because obviously it doesn't have the wheels that it's riding on now, it's just riding on the wood blocks. But it's actually not that big a deal to just pull the sled forward, you know, a half an inch or so that you'll see me do here in this next clip. The other thing I am testing is a dust collection idea. You'll basically see this box that I've attached to the back of my router sled, and it's got two hoses going to my dust collector. I've seen some other people have pretty good success with this. Um, I'll kind of go over in a second why I think it didn't work that great, primarily because the sled's too high off the deck. But you'll see the way that it's attached to the sled, and then you'll see how it's attached to my dust collector, which is a grizzly dust collector. It's a three horsepower. It has a ton of power. I just think the design isn't exactly that great. So this whole assembly is sitting on top of a polk style workbench and the advantage of having a sacrificial top is you can screw in these wooden wedges and you wanna make sure that you do a really good job securing this to the table before you start the operations. Otherwise, if it shifts, you lose your uh, parallel point. It's just a quick shot showing the dust collector hose going over and then it runs up my wall to my cyclone. So this is the beginning of using the sled. Um, I know someone's going to make a comment and say, well, why don't you just put a shroud in front of it and that would collect the dust that's shooting out the front. The problem is the, sh the, the shrouds would have to be flexible enough to go up and down. Otherwise, they're going to curl under the assembly itself and get caught in the router bit. So putting something on the front is not as easy as it sounds unless you can really get it away from the bit. So. You can kind of watch the challenges here of the bits flying everywhere and then I'll go over an overview once we're done. Well, I think I'm gonna call this a moderate fail. So what did work is the riser block was fine. Um, that did help me get over it. And then I did stepped passes, basically. This end was too high, so I just kept increasing the bit and then coming back. Overall, the cut quality isn't bad. Um, you know, there is some tear out in there, but we'll talk about that in the next video. Um, this dust collection just didn't work. 
And I've seen some guys on YouTube that have a similar setup and it looks like theirs is successful. I think maybe one of the problems was that because this is so high, there's this big gap between my shrouds. So like maybe if I did a whole longer shroud, but honestly I was looking at the suction power right below it where the cavity is here and uh, it just did not seem to have enough suction um, to pull these parts up. So I don't know, maybe back to the drawing board and we'll see if we can figure something out or you know, you can just flatten it and sweep your shop out. This is the part that sucks is that you have wood everywhere, which isn't the end of the world. And I can blow it out and usually blow it out my driveway over to where the mill kind of cleanup is anyway. But I was hoping for just a landslide victory. Like I was going to crack the code for router sled mess. Not today, boys. Not today. Boys and girls. All right, well the sanding process is going good on the top. I'm gonna to flip it over and show you guys the process that I use. I wanted to just take a second and go over the current sanding setup that I have. Um, there's a lot of buzz online about the rotary gear sander, specifically Festool Rotex is a very popular unit. I actually tried out the Bosch sander, which it's called the ETS, I think, their new one, which is a very similar model to Festool. I'm sure it's not the same, but it's a similar concept. Random Orbit that also has gear. I didn't like it, and I'm gonna explain to you why. I don't like being over a piece where I feel like the tool is really grabby with both hands. It's not really comfortable for me. So the setup that I use that I'm really liking right now is this big Makita belt sander. And what I do is I do a 50 grit belt to start and then I go up to an 80 and then I switch over to this, which I talk about in a second. Now the belts that I'm using, these are from an eBay seller. I'm going to put the sellers. Um, information on the video screen right here. He sells these X weight belts that are turquoise and these things are awesome. I've never found the sanding belt yet that matches it. They're really heavy duty, which means that the seam isn't going dit -dit 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 when it's going around and they last forever. So the pattern that I use, which is a copy from the Samurai Carpenter is called cross hatching. So what you'll see me do is I'll go across the piece like this and I'll create a scratch pattern this way and then I'll turn it 180 degrees or maybe 45 degrees, some, something to split up the lines to where I'm going this way. And when you start cross hatching like that, essentially you're on a microscopic level starting to break all those pieces down much faster and much easier. Then what I'm following it up with is this Mercaderos. This is a pretty expensive unit, but man, is it worth it. Um, I am totally sold with this thing. It does a lot of rapid stock removal and it's really easy to use. It's super easy and comfortable. And I like this setup because both of them are easy. I can show you when I use this, it's effortless to move this across the piece and the same with this. Everybody was talking about these Merca Abranet discs and I was like, eh, are they really that cool? They are amazing. This is built like no other sandpaper disc and it'd be really hard for me to show you how it is on the camera here, but the whole design and the weaving of it, these things seem to last forever. This elm is hard as a rock. And when I sand with this, this thing barely even seems like that I've been using it. So um, let me go through the process and show you um, how we're gonna be sanding this. And then uh, we'll hopefully get through to making our um, putty mixture that we talked about, starting to seal all this in and then see if, see if it works. Like I mentioned before, this is all a test on this piece because we have a bunch of these to do and I really wanna get the combination right before I keep batching them out. So let me flip this thing over and we'll show you how we're gonna do it.
All right, well now we're gonna start mixing up the epoxy and what I'm using is just a Pro Marine Supplies epoxy that I got off Amazon. I'm also gonna be using some Trans Tint Brown. This is Honey Amber is the actual color. And then we're gonna be using some sawdust, some Elm sawdust. And the plan here is to remember, fill the cracks, but we don't wanna saturate the whole thing. I'm trying to put the least amount of epoxy in here so that I can make this economical to make small tables and turn them out. So um, this thing is really cool. If you don't have one of these digital scales for mixing epoxy, they're really inexpensive and they work great. Basically, we're gonna zero it out with this tray on and then we're gonna start mixing these. All right, so I just added the trans tint. That came out way faster than I thought, which might darken this up a lot, but we're just gonna roll with it. All right, I'm pretty sure we got the consistency now. It's kind of like uh, all natural peanut butter is how I would describe it. So not 100% sure if this is work, but this is the one that we're gonna stick with and see how it goes. All right, well, I've given this piece about four days to fully dry, and right now I'm using the Merca sander with an 80 grit, just a standard piece of sandpaper. You can see that it's getting clogged a lot, which is why I'm using that eraser to kind of unclog it. It's doing a good job as far as breaking down the high spots um, from that epoxy paste that we put on there, but it was clogging way too frequently, so you'll see me uh, go back to using the belt sander here just to kind of get um, the majority of that paste brought down to a level area. And I'm using a 100 grit belt because I don't want to introduce new scratch lines in the finish. I want to keep them as superficial as possible um, because the top of it before I put that finish on there was already sanded to, um, to 120. And then here we're just doing the sides with a little orbital sander, it was just easier to use this one than the Merca. So here we're using the Merca with a um, 120 Abranet mesh disc, and this is where this thing really shines. The finish is absolutely awesome with the sander, and you can see I flip it over to look there was zero clogging with this, which is what they advertise it will do. Um, a lot of that dust is remaining from the prior sanding disc I was using, which was not one of the Abernets. Um, but the thing, all the pores are open, and it continued to perform awesome, putting a great finish on this. And then I used the 120 and then the 180 before we did finish on it. So this is my standard finish that I use for these type of projects. I get the spar urethane and a satin finish at Lowe's. And then these fine filters that you see me using, you can get at Harbor Freight, as well as these paint brushes. I use these big four inch brushes 
and the tin that I'm putting it in, I get off Amazon, it's called the meatloaf tin, and you can get like 100 of them for 10 bucks. And these brushes work really well to put the finish on. Um, they are not reusable though. Uh, once you put them on, they're pretty much done. Um, but they do a good job of getting a smooth finish, which you can see me doing here. Um, when you're doing a standard like slab, it's good to put the finish on and then do one final pass. Since this is end grain, it's just sopping up all of the finish. So you see me kind of going all over the place. And you can see on the sides here that I left some of that um, mixture, that putty epoxy mixture on there. I was just kind of messing around and seeing what it looked like. Um, I'd like to hear your opinion in the comments if you think I should have taken it all the way down to um, the bare wood that you see in some of the parts or if you like this kind of textured appeal. I think I like the textured one, but again, like I said, this is just a, a sample piece. Um, we'll look at it when it's all done and you can kind of get an impression of whether you like it or not. All right, so after several coats of finish, this piece is done. You can see on the edge that I actually sanded that down a lot more from the prior shot that I showed you. I kind of like this cleaner look a little bit better. If you look at the piece from this side, you might think, wow, that looks awesome, nice job. But I'll show you one problem. The large gaps that we had in the side filled really well with that putty mixture. All of those held together, there's no cracking, they look great. The problem is all these little microscopic cracks here, the putty did not seal those that great. And you can see when I change the camera angle here in the light, those little teeny micro cracks resulted in a ton of bubbling in that spar urethane finish. And I redid this three times, sanding it down, trying to get these out and the cracks just keep coming. So. I'm kind of bummed, but I learned a lot about finishing these cookie pieces, specifically the elm ones that have a lot of cracks in the top. Um, I know this video was a little long, so I apologize about that, but hopefully you guys have picked up some good tips and tricks if you're doing this, or if you have something to share, I always encourage um, some positive feedback in the comments, maybe on what works for you. What my goal is for this is I'm gonna actually slice off this top piece with the bandsaw mill, and then I'm gonna wrap this whole perimeter in Tyvek tape, and I'm gonna end up just doing a standard epoxy flood on the top. Um, what I found works really well is just leaving the epoxy containers on the registers of your vents for your furnace, you know, like your floor vents, so it gets nice and warm without getting too hot, and then it floods pretty easily, hopefully filling in all these cracks. So. Hope you picked something up from this one and have a great day. Talk to you soon.